Welcome. Can you see this color? How would you describe it? Perhaps you would say it's the color of the sea, the sky, water, a butterfly. Things that have been around since the beginning of prehistoric times. But the ancient Hebrews would not have described it that way. Neither would the Greeks. Greek words for describing the sky often included copper and iron, and the sea was often painted as black in the Iliad. In fact, the Egyptians were the only ancient culture to develop a word for blue. This is due to them beginning mining lapis lazuli nearly 6,000 years ago and dye production. Due to this rarity, it was often used to adorn divine beings such as Cleopatra and the gods. But did they literally not see blue? After all, color is only electrical signals being interpreted by the brain. The answer is a little bit of yes, no, and maybe. The brain separates things into readily available categories. Weights, lengths, and, of course, colors. If someone were to ask you how long something was, you would be roughly able to guess at about a meter or about a yard. This is because your brain associates those links with a real world application. This is the same with colors. Unfortunately for blue, it is very rarely found in nature compared with other colors. There are 280,000 flowering plants coming in all hues. Only 10% are blue. See, blue is not a naturally occurring compound in plants and animals in the same way that plants are green from chlorophyll. Blue is derived from tricks of the light played on the purple compound anthocyanin. All of this is to say that blue is just not useful enough due to its rarity to have a separate category meaning, in some ways, ancient people did not see blue. This can actually be seen in languages and tribes today. An intrepid scientist named Edward Gibson decided to lug standardized color chips to the Amazon jungle to ask the Tismain hunter-gatherer tribe what they would call the color. They discovered two interesting concepts. The tribe's limited color vocabulary was just as good as modern English speakers describing white, black, and red, as well as warm colors, such as yellows and oranges. But the tribe had a difficult time describing greens, blues, and cool colors. So what changed when humans went from hunter-gatherer tribes to modern jet-setting entrepreneurs? As discussed before, the brain decides what is important and focuses on those stimuli, and color descriptions follow this pattern. William Gladstone combed through the Iliad in 1858 and discovered that black is mentioned 200 times, white 100, red 15, and green and yellow less than 10. Were the Greeks living in a monochrome world devoid of color? Of course not! Nobody would describe the Mediterranean in that way, but they needed a way to separate day from night, arguably the most important color distinction. The divide between black and white appears in every language. Red is the next color to appear, often associated with blood and wine. Apparently, danger and alcoholism are the second most important concepts around the world. All jokes aside, Blood is a common precursor to death, making it very important. The next colors to come up in conversation are greens and yellows. It's theorized that this is especially useful to distinguish between plants. Richard Schultz, an ethnobotanist specializing in Amazonian tribes, would frequently ask the tribe's men and women to identify plants that he could tell no difference in, and they would confidently separate them in two different species going so far as to only use one in rituals and medicines, and not the other. Another Amazonian tribe, the Barinmo, that lives in close-knit communities was interviewed with many colors for differing shades of green. This was further documented in Namibia. The Himba tribe, a cattle herding people, have neither a word for blue nor distinctions between blue and green but they have many words for shades of green and yellow. 
Interestingly, the Himba were less likely to agree on the names of the colors than the Burinmo, which suggests that lifestyle has something to do with the development of the color system. In fact, English-speaking children and Himba children who knew no color names were also tested and named colors similarly. So, did the Greeks see blue as a category? The answer is indeed somewhere in between, but there is even more of a gray area here. Could they physically see blue? Some research suggests that they could not. In 2006, Stanford University surveyed English and Russian students with blue color swatches spanning a spectrum of light to dark. Russian, unlike English, divides blue into categories of light and dark, while English simply uses blue as a descriptor. The Russian students were more likely to recall which shade of blue they viewed, unlike the English students. While this sounds like a case of language influencing memory, it may not be that simple. Blue is the shortest wavelength and therefore requires more sensitive eyes to detect. UVB, the ultraviolet rays responsible for most skin cancer, can damage the ocular lens, and that damage compounds over time. Russia would have a lower UV index on average. A review of 203 languages showed that areas with low UVB rays tend to have a word for blue, while high UVB areas tended to not have a word for blue. English speakers in a 2001 study were given lenses that simulated differing damages. The more damage to the lens meant less of a chance to describe a color as blue. Of course, this was a small study, but it is a possibility. So is seeing blue the result of the environment, linguistics, superior eyesight? Like most things, it seems that it is a combination of all three. The environment requires different things for survival. Maybe it's the culture or lifestyle of that particular people or group. Maybe it's the communal activities they do on a daily basis. Or it's their language and the need to agree on basic principles for communication. I think that even if the ancient Greeks didn't describe the sea or sky as blue, they definitely saw it. The real question we still need to answer is what color that dress really is. Thanks for watching. Which factor do you think is the most important? Let us know in the comments below and subscribe. We'd love to see you around here again soon.